Welcome to Principles of International Relations. In today's class, we are talking about the East Asian power and security structure. And I think this is one of the most exciting topics uh, within international relations at the moment. Uh, why is that the case? Well, primarily um, uh, with the rise of China or the rising power of China within the region and in the world, um, this becomes a much more um, volatile uh, region at the one hand because um, there are several unresolved um, conflicts around the South China Sea, but also the Daesh and Sengaku Islands with Japan um, and, and many other um, uh, situations within the region don't seem to be completely resolved. At the same time, the very high economic dependency of the region uh, on each other is also uh, very prominent. And so we do see this interesting con uh, pull and push connection between the different uh, countries within the region. And so I look very much forward to um, exploring this topic in more detail together with you. And I will go right into the slides now. Thank you. Today I would like to talk about uh, the security structure in East Asia and South, Southeast Asia. And um, I will focus primarily on the, on the following things. So I will uh, uh, specifically look at, the, at the, uh, the role of the major powers. And in this way uh, I will talk about the United States, Japan and especially also about China. Um, but besides these kind of uh, um, security, um, the, 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 the power relations between the different countries, um, I will also kind of want to focus on something which is called new challenges, like international security, human security, and counterterrorism. These are forms which are maybe not falling in the classical for, uh, realm of, of um, uh, um, great power politics and therefore are very differently handled. And what we can see here is that um, while we have uh, difficult relations between the, 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 the major powers uh, in, in, in the traditional kind of uh, state power uh, relations, we have much more kind of conciliatory and cooperative uh, relations on other issues. And uh, the kind of divergence in these different areas I would like to highlight. So if, um, I will will start with two discussion questions, and I think if you kind of looked at this this class, I would like you to um, 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 pause this uh, this uh, um, this video for a minute or a couple of minutes and think about these questions and ideally write them down on our padlets. And I'm really curious to see what you what you have to say about them. So the first one is a maybe, maybe very basic question, but do you think Japan faces a security dilemma? In the current situation in East Asia, do you think there is um, a security search for Japan existence or not? And why this is the case? And the second thing is, um, um, is how important is the presence of the United States uh, to keep this region stable? So something which might surprise you is that in East, when you're talking about East Asia, we again talk about the United States. And one of the reasons is that for the security structure of the, of the area, you, the United States is very important. Why? Because it has um, security relations with many, many, in many countries uh, within the region. And um, so, so I want you to kind of evaluate how, from your perspective, how important you think the U.S. Uh, uh, presence is, and what you think about uh, the future in these relations. So, if you think about the major powers, uh, we can think about uh, um, we can basically think about in East Asia in three major powers, and the worst one is the United States, second one, Japan, third one, China. Uh, United States, I mentioned already um, why it is included in this list. It is especially not because it is, of course, located in East Asia, but rather because of its uh, prominence in terms of security alliances or opponent structures. So we, we do know about the uh, about the trade war between China and the United States, which have been very disruptive for international trade and has been a, a cause of concern um, for, for, 
um, not just political, but also economic actors as well. Um, but um, some of the uh, security structures of, of countries within the region are heavily based on the reliance of the, of the, on the United States. And so this is a really important factor to consider as well. Um, then the second one uh, is how will Japan project its political economic power in, in Asia? We do see that a, in the recent uh, decades, uh, relative power relations between between the uh, um, um, have have changed over time. While um, Japan has been for a long time the the, the most developed uh, economy within the region, uh, with the highest uh, GDP uh, and also um, um, GDP per capita, um, we do see, uh, but in in some way, kind of restrained it, 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 its its uh, military power. Um, uh, due to, to historical reasons and the, and the Second World War, but also due to, <clears throat> to the close relationship with the United States and therefore having less of a necessity to develop its economic, uh, its political power, um, or its, its military power even further. But in the recent uh, maybe 30, 40 years, we have seen a, a constant rise of China and a kind of maybe uh, China replacing uh, uh, Japan as the major power within the region, but also kind of being becoming a challenger for the United States. So in this way, this kind of um, is an interesting aspect uh, because of the security structure uh, between the US and Japan, but also whether China is challenging um, the relations between those two states as well. Um, so if we kind of think about East Asia, uh, what kind of conflicts we could primarily um, point out, we do have uh, one conflict which is between uh, China and Japan and also Taiwan, and that's this uh, uh, around the Sengaku or Daesh, Sengaku in Japanese, Daesh in, in, in Chinese. Uh, islands, uh, which are you can see here in the in a red circle. Um, these uh, uh, islands, um, there is a territorial dispute between China and Japan. Both, uh, like currently, they belong uh, to to Japan, but uh, China claims that they should belong uh, to China. Additionally, Taiwan claims. Uh, that they should belong to, to Taiwan as well. This is further complicating the situation because China also feels that it is the, is the sole representation of, uh, of, uh, of a Chinese territory uh, on a global stage and therefore is also neglecting the, the right of Taiwan to kind of have independent claims and being in, uh, of course being independent, but also having, having claims on certain islands. So this is one of the kind of key issues around uh, between China and Japan in terms of territory. There's another kind of key conflict zone, and then you, I'm sure you're aware of it. This is the uh, area of North Korea. Of course, North Korea being a partner uh, in, in some way uh, to China, while, um, while traditionally they have been uh, allies, uh, China is not necessarily happy with all the decisions that have taken in North Korea and the acceleration of the nuclear program has not been necessarily always been seen as, as positive by, by the Chinese uh, uh, as well. But generally speaking, the closest of an ally and, uh, North Korea has is, is China. Of course, uh, North Korea threatens uh, its other neighbors, especially South Korea, Japan, but also, of course, um, the United States. So these are the kind of the, the key kind of conflict arenas which we could think about uh, in, in, East, uh, in East Asia. Um, we, uh, I did deliberately did not include issues between uh, between Russia and uh, and Japan. Um, also, other is conflicts between South Korea and Japan, which are not uh, over territory, but other issues. And I did also not include the South Ch issues on on the South China Sea, which are numerous and and kind of um, yeah are, are vital as well um, in in uh, exploring the the region in a in a broader sense and saying East Asia and Southeast Asia. Why you could do this is is especially because um, because a lot of the, the relations are kind of connected with each other um, around the, the the topic of. Uh, rising strengths of China and a new kind of a, an adjustment uh, behavior of 
of um, the countries around it uh, towards this this kind of rise rise in power. Um, we do have here a military capital. Um, what we do see, um, this is only to 2015, so it's not n n newest data, but it kind of in terms of the trend, what we do see here, which is really important, is that all the countries um, uh, within the region have ac accelerated their military spending. And this is the most visible in China, and China actually has since 2015 tremendously extended its, its military spending, and it is much higher nowadays uh, than it used to be. But also the other countries, Japan, as well as territories like uh, Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia, all kind of increased um, their, their military spending. Also Taiwan as a territory uh, also increased its military spending. We did have like Germany is just in a comparison in there. Um, Germany had a slight military increase in its military spending, but not in the, to the same extent as we do see in um, in East Asia as well as in Southeast Asia, East Asia. Um, uh, and we do see a decline of military spending in the United States. This is true, uh, but this is uh, also kind of, of course, 1997 was a backlog of um, the, um, the, the Cold War, uh, which was ended, but still this kind of uh, increasing costs still there. And we also have to mention that the military spending of the United States is still in proportion much higher than, than other, other countries. And therefore, um, it's, it's, it's seen like way above the level of, of, of the other countries, even including China, even though it has tremendously increased its military spending. Well, in, in terms of understanding the Asian Pacific security architecture, I think it is maybe useful to kind of think about it in, in comparison to the European um, 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 security architecture because there's a big difference here. And I think that kind of um, leads to a situation where uh, security is perceived differently and collaboration between different countries is also perceived differently based on the security. And so what is really important is the impact, of course, of the Cold War. Uh, strategic circumstances uh, changed quite a lot. We had before a very kind of the, on a global stage, we had a division between the, the, the global West and the global East. And these kind of uh, areas have kind of um, acted in competition. China, in a way, um, of course, being a uh, um, so-called communist country, um, did never really go along well with uh, 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 with the Soviet Union during this this kind of block, and therefore um, did not kind of affiliate as closely um, with the with the um, um, with the Eastern Bloc, um, but uh, kind of changed much earlier its economic uh, model into a much more market driven driven model. But after the end of the Cold War, the kind of the the economic development in in China accelerated. And kind of made tremendous change in the in the in the power structure within East Asia because China became just much more influential and important. Um, in a way, what we do see is that already as a leftover from the from the um, the Cold War, uh, the U.S. had a very strong interest, a strategic interest within East Asia, and as kind of is, is, is dominant in the in the security structure of East Asia. That um, how this is this is done is basically around the, the idea of providing specific alliances with, with key players within the region. And the maybe most notable we should kind of, kind of mention here are the Japanese-US alliance, the security alliance, where Japan is heavily relying on its, uh, the protection guarantees of the United States um, for its own kind of uh, um, uh, military um, de or defense strategy. The same thing is true for, for South Korea, the South Korean US alliance uh, has been has been boosted up and it's also kind of a vital part of the of the security structure of South Korea. 
So, um, so we do have corporate security within the region, which is multi-layered. But the important aspect here is really that it is based on bilateral agreements between specific countries in the United States. And I would like to visualize this here. So what we do see here is that, um, that the United States had different um, approaches in Europe than it had in Asia. In Asia, it had bilateral agreements with South Korea, Japan, uh, of course, the, uh, um, the countries like Australia and New Zealand uh, in, a, in a wider range, but also the Philippines um, and, and Thailand. And so in this way, um, they had individual kind of, uh, um, or they still have individual kind of bilateral agreements where they are all kind of coming together at the point of the United States. So they're always in the, uh, with the United States, um, not necessarily among the states, uh, but rather in relation to the United States. And the United States is, uh, is being a very important player in terms of security strategies. This has um, an advantage that actually the kind of security relations can be targeted for specific kind of needs of these individual states. And that has been seen as a great advantage. But at the same time, if you compare it to the European Sea, that what we do have is an organization under the umbrella of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, which is much more uh, inclusive. It's an organization where most European countries are members of, including uh, the North American countries, Canada and the United States. Yeah, some are, um, and so this is kind of, uh, there's also Turkey is also a really important player in this. Um, but the important aspect here is that there's a, this is a unified um, uh, institutional setup where it is not just a bilateral relation between each country of, the NA of NATO and the United States, but rather um, the United States and the other actors as a collective um, um, actor kind of summarized in NATO. And that makes a difference because the relationship between uh, NATO and in, in, in the member states in, in NATO is really crucial for the success and the, sur the survival of NATO in itself. So the relations between France, UK, Turkey, Germany are as maybe not completely as important as between these countries in the United States, but also very important. While relations in the, in the Asian arena uh, are not in the same category. So you could say like relations between China, Japan and the United States are very important for their security structure. Relations between South Korea and the United States are very important for the security structure in, in the region. But relationship between um, Japan and South Korea are much less important uh, for, the actual, um, for the actual security structure. So in this way, uh, this kind of bilateral approach uh, increases flexibility and kind of makes it more targeted to specific actors. But at the same time, um, it is not as collaborative and therefore a kind of good relations between the actors which have all the uh, relations to the United States is not necessarily in the same way given. So if we kind of um, if we kind of think of what happened uh, at the end of the Cold War, how did we have change in this? Uh, we can see that uh, that there is a big impact of uh, um, One second, please. Okay, my apologies for this interruption. So in Europe, um, what, what are the kind of the, the, the consequences of uh, the end of the Cold War? Well, in Europe, it primarily um, that meant to the dissolving of the Warsaw Pact. So if we kind of look back at this and see that um, uh, the Warsaw Pact was the Eastern Euro uh, European and Russian collaboration as a block, as a security defense, basically mirroring the, uh, the attempts uh, NATO has, has done on the, on the, on the, in the West. And so this uh, pact got dissolved after the end of the Cold War. And um, therefore, 
change the security structure within uh, within Eastern Europe quite a lot. A lot of uh, one of the aspects of this was uh, that NATO expanded and the new member states of the European Union also became member states of NATO and therefore kind of pushed the boundaries of NATO further to the east. At the same time, there was the uh, Europeans also stepped up their security and defense as an entity and kind of created the European security and defense policy, ESDP, which is um, in a way uh, was an effort to kind of uh, be, uh, for European Union to become a major defense player, which is uh, while they made some progress in this uh, area, um, their, their role is still diminished. And so I wouldn't kind of put it on par with, with other key players like NATO because the capacity is just not uh, in the same way existent. But it is another attempt in Europe which changed after the end of the Cold War. In Asia, the hub um, uh, uh, periphery is yes, kind of a system where where the United States kind of provides security guarantees uh, for the for the individual countries stayed mostly the same. So in this way, there hasn't been any kind of strategic change uh, from this, uh, from the U.S. engagement and from the Asian um, countries, which have been uh, uh, which have been in alliances with the United States. Um, the circumstances, of course, changed because of the rise of China, but not necessarily the end of the Cold War. Um, but we did see some kind of attempts of rising multilateral security. Um, and, and so this, uh, especially around, the, uh, around the, the conflict zones as uh, North Korea, uh, we have seen efforts to kind of work more multilaterally. But at the same time, still the, the bulk of the security concept is bilateral, not multilateral. So if you can think about the strategic kind of circumstances, uh, we can actually see that for quite a long time there was a dim, like there was a de decline um, uh, of the large scale threats. Um, so the east west confrontation and the, uh, the nuclear uh, uh, arms race uh, was of course stopped with the end of the Cold War and the transformation of the USSR into Russia as well. We have in recent years, we have a re-emergent as Russia as a major security player and becoming more and more confrontational. We see this in, 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 in situations like in the Ukraine and, and, and others, but at the same time, it's not at the same level as during the Cold War. However, in terms of large scale threats for the future, we could expect uh, that maybe there will be an extended challenge between China and the United States. We have seen the first kind of uh, part of this in terms of the, 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 the trade war and the extreme con confrontation between China and the United States on economic terms. Uh, this has not escalated in any kind of uh, security uh, uh, rearm yet. Uh, and hopefully it will not, but at the same time, it, can, it is not uh, out of the question that this will be a development which we have to watch in the, in the future as well. What we do see actually is much more, uh, uh, much more pressing maybe are kind of rising regional issues. Um, the, North, uh, the Korean nuclear crisis and, um, and also the Korea, which is kind of going until, until now and the Taiwan Strait tension, which are also since 1996, but which are also going on until now are one of the most pressing regional uh, um, issues. Um, we had in, in recent years, we have several developments of uh, the Korean nuclear crisis in terms of uh, uh, trying to have uh, um, negotiations which resolve it, which have been largely unsuccessful between the, the Kim Jong-un and, and, and President uh, Trump. We don't know how this will be under the Biden presidency, if we kind of see the same uh, kind of efforts put into, into resolving the Korean, nu um, um, Korean uh, nuclear issue. We also have seen uh, issues around the Taiwan Straits. Um, and this has been kind of uh, escalating again in the recent years, becoming more and more important again. We have seen that China is becoming more assertive in terms of, um, of singling out uh, um, Taiwan 
um, in, 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 for example, in during the COVID-19 pandemic in, in terms of, uh, of the World Health Organization, but also in other issues that the tone is extending and they're becoming more aggressive. And so we could see that this is a further escalation in, in the, the issue on the Taiwan Straits, but also in, the, in Taiwan itself. Um, where can we see multilateral uh, uh, rise of security? And we can see something, especially um, in terms of dial, uh, in terms of framework, we can kind of point towards the ASEAN Regional Forum, which were primarily is an economic forum, but um, for, for uh, quite some time is also dealing with issues of security and dealing with issues of alternative security, which I will discuss a little later on. So this kind of is, of course, not including the key players of, um, um, of, uh, um, of Japan and, uh, and, and China, but it is an, in, in um, Southeast Asia, it's a major effort to have a regional organization um, which, is, uh, which is active um, in kind of promoting security. Uh, uh, other kind of dialogue track two kind of frameworks are uh, the Council of Security Cooperation in Asia and Pacific, which is CS CSCAP, and the North Asian Cooperation Dialogue, NEACD. These are two kind of attempts which are called track two dialogues. So they are not on the highest level, but on the background level in order to kind of create cooperation and create kind of... Uh, um, a dialogue which uh, leads to understanding of the different positions of the different actor in order to kind of uh, de-escalate um, conflict. So in the 1990s, we had something, uh, an, an effort which was really important, which was the US East Asian Regional Security um, effort. And it is called our friend, like, let me kind of quote what the American, the US Department of Defense said about this. Our friends and allies in East Asia are reluctant to enter into multilateral consultation on security concerns for a variety of reasons. Foremost, it is the wide cultural, political, economic diversity among most of the Asian states, which make bilateral security arrangements much more appropriate. So this is pointing out why we have actually a difference in the, in the European arena versus the the US arena. And that is basically kind of showing that animosities within the region are stronger than maybe animosities we have on, uh, among the European countries. And therefore it becomes, the, and also the political systems are more diverse, and therefore it becomes more difficult to have a, um, an, a multilateral uh, cooperation on, uh, uh, on security issues. Unfortunately, what we find is that these kind of animosities did not kind of degree since the 1990s, but rather became stronger. So to have like a multilateral kind of agreement within the region might become even more difficult than it used to be. Um, another kind of quote on the same kind of issue is some in the United States have been reluctant to enter in the regional security dialogue in Asia, but I see this as a way to supplement our alliance and send forward military presence, not to be supplement them. So in a way also, not only, um, not only Asian countries are not necessarily interested in a regional co uh, security cooperation uh, on a regional level, like uh, a multilateral level, but also the United States um, is not necessarily kind of seeing it as the core essence of, of their security structure in the region. And one of the issues here is um, that bilateral agreements can be much more targeted towards the specific needs. And that kind of is also beneficial for the United States because it's specific uh, strategic needs uh, can, be uh, can be kind of um, uh, served much better in these kind of bilateral agreements. Having said that, uh, in total, a, a multilateral agreement makes, uh, uh, makes it easier to have a unified block of interest and also policy decisions. And that is making it for diff more difficult for adversaries uh, to act against it. Um, something which is, uh, which is really um, kind of uh, seen as a, a good strategy in kind of especially in this area of Korean Peninsula and the Taiwan Straits, is this uh, um, a double track approach. So what we do see here is the idea of preventive diplomacy and deterrence response, which are kind of really important. 
So deterrent uh, and uh, response to kind of threats, but also kind of having diplomacy in order to kind of uh, um, um, to, 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 to limit the, the consequences of, of future actions and not kind of leading to escalation. Um, in a way, the alliance mechanisms with the US and uh, Japan and the US and Korea, Korea are very at essence in these kind of situations in order to kind of keep the status quo stable. A cooperative security is much more important for prevent, uh, providing preventive dip diplomacy and kind of providing uh, uh, maybe kind of working towards resolving issues. However, something which we have seen and also in the region of Asia is that uh, national tendencies become much stronger um, in recent years and um, maybe also as a consequence of America first uh, have created increasing insecurity within the region, how strong uh, or how reliable the United States can be as a, as a security partner or kind of how much a country like Japan, for example, can rely on that security provided by by the United States, and that kind of led to um, to to a hesitation to kind of enter into more collaborative security. Um, something which is quite uh, um, interesting in this way is that um, is, is to go, if you think about the dynamic security uh, in, in in the present time is, um, uh, as I said, the US strategy and engagement in East Asia is, is varying. It has been quite strong under the Obama administration. Under the Trump administration, it has been seen as less uh, important and also kind of seen as a real in, in in, increasing cost factor. At the same time, the, uh, uh, um, the United States has taken on uh, uh, China, in, in, in especially in the economic arena, but also uh, in other areas, and therefore a kind of um, kind of re in recent years reinforced its alliances with with Japan and and, and Korea extensively. Um, as I said, cooperative security is a multi multi cooperation has been existent and had been kind of extended, but not on the top level, and very often based on ad hoc functional mechanisms. Um, um, I want to kind of, kind of talk the three kind of strategic um, issues, uh, which are maybe really important in understanding the, the, the situation here and the strategic circumstances. And the first one I, I would like to mention here is the rise of asymmetric welfare. So we do have uh, like the, the proliferation issues, which are kind of concerned around North, uh, North Korea specifically, but also um, the threat of terrorism, which was especially in the, in the 20s, uh, in, um, in, in the last 10 years, becoming a kind of a real worry uh, is, is not necessarily a traditional form of power politics and therefore is becoming something uh, which is less uh, possible to kind of control with, with uh, traditional kind of alliances. And what we have seen here is that multilateral cooperation in these kind of issues is becoming much more fluent and much better, even with with countries which are normally not necessarily working closely together. So there is a glimpse of hope in this, in this arena. Um, but there are kind of uh, risks uh, which, are, uh, which are really kind of um, lingering and might actually kind of become um, prevalent in the, in the next, in the nearer future, midterm future. Um, the one which, which we have been talking quite a bit about is the North uh, Korean nuclear crisis, which is, um, which is, uh, has been on the agenda in the in the last years, but basically we did not find many um, many positive outcomes, and the the situation exists. In the, and the, the the success of North Korea to provide uh, to to develop nuclear weapons doesn't necessarily doesn't make this conflict easier, but rather even more more difficult to solve. The increased um, strength of, of China, as I mentioned before, and the and, uh, kind of consequences on Taiwan and Taiwan Straits is also kind of escalating in recent years. It's also on the backdrop of the conflict between China and the United States on in the uh, trade war, it becomes more important. So we do see uh, a risk in, in these kind of concrete examples. Uh, we could also mention the situation in Hong Kong here, of course, which, um, is, is partly seen as an international uh, 
issue or, or a Chinese issue, depending on the perspective. But they all kind of increase the level of unsecurity. The rise of China and rising Chinese capability, of course, maybe makes a shift in these situations, which are difficult to balance for countries like like the United States, because it makes a, a threat, for example, to take Taiwan by force more credible over time. And that is, of course, something which is worrying and kind of needs some kind of ad ad adjustment of the security strategy of the United States as well. Um, what we see here is kind of basically the North Korean missile range. And what we do see here is that over time, this has been extended and we can expect that uh, actually um, that, uh, that North Korea can lead at least some uh, U.S. territory um, by now or at least in the, in the nearer future. And that, of course, uh, kind of escalates the threat for the United States as well, uh, which doesn't kind of uh, which which might might make it a more uh, uh, immediate problem for the United States as well. Um, okay. If we think about the Japan-U.S. alliance as well as the Korea-US alliance, we do see that there are some renovations, some reshuffling and some kind of change of focus um, available. Um, the one aspect of this, which is really important is that um, there's an increased challenge of, of China, as I mentioned before, which um, kind of uh, led to a re-evaluation re of the United States about their kind of capabilities within the region. But at the same time, um, the last uh, US president, President Trump, uh, also kind of had, an, uh, had a strategy of uh, reducing costs in, uh, in foreign military, um, um, foreign military activities. And so he had, has had an attempt to actually kind of re reduce the presence of the United States in the arena. So we have two different kind of actions. On the one hand, the, the perceived higher challenge by, the, by China within the region, and on the other hand, um, the, the cost cutting and, and the, the lower uh, intensity of the United States is in the region. And so the, these kind of work against each other. So what we do see, however, from the Japan-US alliance is that there is an attempt to kind of create a more common global alliance. And this, this attempt is that uh, it goes beyond this kind of bilateral agreement and maybe kind of uh, create, um, envisions a regional or even global context um, of, of containment of China, but also um, uh, um, a kind of context of the of security in, on a global uh, on a global space. Um, this is not very well developed yet, and what we have seen is some relocation of U.S. bases in Japan, but not no major changes yet. But this could be some kind of project which is very becoming more prominent in the future. In the course of uh, the Korea-U.S. alliances. Um, we have also a transformation, but it's much more. It's also um, quite constrained. Um, there are kind of specific alliances which are dealing with the threat of North Korea, FOTA and SPI uh, specifically, but they also do see um, a reduction of 12,500 US troops from the demilitarized um, zone, uh, DMZ, um, in, 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 to the North Korean border. And um, there is a, an attempt to kind of cooperate on autonomous defense uh, methods. And one way uh, this, is, uh, this is important is actually kind of the, provide the ability to reduce the troops um, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, space. Um, so we do see that um, Japan-US alliances are kind of shifting, but at the same time, not necessarily towards them. Um, uh, uh, increased collaboration or maybe cost cutting as well. Um, alternatively to this kind of uh, revamping of the bilateral 
uh, relations, especially in South Korea and uh, in Japan, we feel also we also notice that there are uh, incentives for multilateral cooperation uh, for in, in terms of the ASEAN uh, a regional forum, which is often used as a basis uh, for kind of especially in Southeast Asia uh, to uh, provide uh, some kind of security mechanism which is going beyond the level. One problem with the uh, with ASEAN in this in this uh, in this regional setting is that the political systems are very different within within ASEAN, and therefore kind of uh, agreement over. Um, um, security, like the, the evaluation of, of security mechanisms is also different in these different countries. And uh, like historic situations uh, kind of still have a, a certain level of distrust, which makes it difficult um, to see that. Something which is much more prominent and is actually kind of has been uh, successful is uh, our kind of sub-regional uh, security mechanisms, which are based on on specific kind of problems. So we have the six party talks um, uh, in, 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 in to, to kind of cope with the, with the North Korean conflict, which have been at parts successful, but of course not uh, totally, but it seemed like an approach which is more ad hoc uh, against such specific um, kind of um, uh, threat levels uh, and, and kind of uh, find more flexible situation, uh, uh, solutions. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is, um, is in, in the same kind of rearm. It's a very uh, informal group uh, which is trying to find solutions, maybe even innovative solutions for specific kind of security threats and kind of build a forum, a platform for cooperation or maybe not necessarily always cooperation, but at least for communication. Uh, we do have also some types of military exercises which are heavily used in East Asia in order to kind of uh, coordinate uh, military activity, but more often actually in order to um, kind of warn uh, potential enemies um, of, um, of the, the, the capabilities. So they have been seen as controversial, uh, for example, South Korean, Japan, uh, China, South Korean, Japanese and uh, US um, uh, joint military exercises have been seen as threatening by um, um, by North Korea, but also China had pro protested against uh, uh, joint military exercises um, in the South China Sea as well. So overall, uh, we do have some kind of um, mechanism which are uh, like on the informal level, but cooperation is much less advanced uh, in a multilateral level than it is on a bilateral level. And the last slide here, I would like to talk about something which is called uh, ad hoc functions and mechanisms. And these are often for, for non-traditional threats. So we do find um, these kind of traditional security threats, but issues like um, counter-terrorism or anti-terrorism uh, cooperation, as well as uh, non-traditional security cooperation around um, disease prevention, anti-piracy, and organized crime is something which is much less controversial. Um, by the member states, and it's also trans. It's kind of um, going beyond the level of uh, of um, of um, the national borders, and is seen much less controversial in terms of the actions against it. So, in this way, uh, we see a much higher level of cooperation. But this is very often ad hoc. If a specific problem is taking place, um, we have in our uh, SARS and the. Uh, Aviation flu, we have seen very good cooperation in terms of um, uh, the, the region. This has been less, um, um, less uh, uh, prominent in, in, the, in the COVID, um, um, in, in the fight against COVID in terms of, uh, at least in terms of um, um, policy uh, prevention, because um, national solutions have been much more prevalent in this, in this situation. Um, but um, beforehand in SARS and under, uh, uh, aviation flow, we have seen some more inter, uh, regional cooperation there. In terms of anti-piracy cooperation and organized crime as well, we do find that cooperation is taking place on the regional level and that this is approach is generally preferred Having said so, some countries are less uh, eager to cooperate, uh, especially in, 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 uh, uh, in, in uh, um, intellectual property theft and anti-piracy uh, um, cooperation. And so, so there are variations in the, in, the, in, the, like in the importance of these issues for the, for the different actors, but generally regional approaches are seen more favorable in these areas. 
So what we do see here as in terms of dynamics, we do see a kind of a tendency uh, um, from forth, uh, to, towards uh, coll collective security. At the one hand, from this kind of bilateral kind of agreements to maybe in, to have a more inclusive multilateral agreements. Also from this kind of um, uh, unforceful corporations um, towards a collective security. Having said that, in the recent years, this has been there have been some setbacks in this and uh, ex extended tension uh, or the heightened tension uh, following the. Um, the, the trade war between the United States and China and the ripple on effect in other conflicts as well as other conflicts like say like between Japan and uh, Korea over over issues like like comfort women are um, are kind of a hindrance in a more uh, extended collective security issues and we don't expect to see uh, this kind of move in the very near future. So that's it for me. 